Uh, for any who are watching via internet can request them and I'll send them attached to an email. Um, <clears throat> but what I did was I combined, uh, basically normally I would do an intro to language and talk about the different periods of the Greek language and that, but start off with the history of written language and then move into the Greek language and where it fits in its family tree and that. Um, so I decided to combine. So the title for this session is the Greek alphabet and language, and then next week we'll look. Uh, next time we'll look at the alphabet itself, and we'll get into the different symbols and how to pronounce them and all that. And so this is sort of just to set the the context for getting into the particulars of the Greek language, and it's important because of the way that we focus on the language, how. We teach it and understand it and study it and want to approach it. And so uh, this is vital information for us to understand some important elements of the Greek language, the fact that it's a living language. It's not dead as many have thought in the past. And same with Hebrew, it's a living language because they're still both used today, so they're not dead. And so when languages are living, they're changing, they're constantly being adjusted to the times and so on. And so we'll look at those different aspects, but I wanted to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. It says, For truly I say to you, this is Christ speaking to the disciples, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, literally in the Greek text, it's not one iota, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So the first statement, the smallest letter, it's pretty clear iota is the same in, in Greek. That indicates that is the smallest letter in the, in the Greek alphabet, and then not a single stroke. And this particular term talks about a seraph. So if we understand this stroke, this term that Christ uses here to talk about the law, if we look at a capital O and a capital Q, the only distinction between those in English is that little tail that's on the capital Q. That's what he's talking about here. And the reason why I come to this is just to remind us of the fact that all the particulars, even the smallest details of the text is important. So when we get into the details of the language, whether it's accents or all that, it's all vital for us to understand the truth of God's Word, even down to the smallest little strokes. And if that's Christ's view of Scripture, that even the, the smallest particulars are vital, then that is the view that we should have about the Word of God, and therefore we approach the language the way that we do. So if you follow along in the notes, <clears throat> I basically condensed the history of uh, written language uh, to about 11 pages. <laughs> so we're going to attempt to walk through that and uh, look at some of the significant aspects of the history of language. The first point that I wanted to talk about was the fact that a language has history, that it is a part of something bigger than itself. Julius Caesar understood this when he wrote a comparative grammar between Latin and Greek because both were used during that time in the Roman Empire. And we can trace all the way back to then even those who are interested in looking at the history of the language and its relationship. And Greek and Latin are a part of the same family and so they are related with each other. You have formal Sanskrit grammar as a result of comparison of Sanskrit and native dialects of India. We have many who have dove into the history of the Indo-European family tree, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, but all these languages are a part of that. Panini, the great Sanskrit scholar and grammarian of the 4th century B.C., his work was known as one of the most remarkable in history and had subtle originality in his approach to dealing with the language, but all of these reflect the fact that they understood that, that a particular language was a part of something bigger than itself, that there was history. Everything has history in this world. Everything does. Uh, even if we look at ourselves, we have history. We all bring history with us when we walk into relationships and that. The same thing with language. Language has history, and it brings that history into other relationships. And we'll talk about this when we get to the alphabet and the different letters and that. There are changes that happen because of the history that lies behind the language, but also because of the relationship. We are affected by people who are around us. When we come in contact with other people, they influence us, we influence them, and there's change that happens. The same thing happens with language. So literally, language is life in, in a certain degree. Professor Alberto um, Trombetti of Rome, he sought connecting link between human speech, 
and he wrote the book, The Unity of Origin of Language, and he believed that there was a common origin behind all languages, and when we approach the way that we approach the Greek language, realizing it's a part of a family and there's a family tree, when we study the language from a linguistical, historical perspective, we, we understand that there is a parent language behind these other languages. So we can see the connections between these languages that are part of the family tree, and we can look back and say, okay, here is the parent tongue that lies behind these. And if we had all the information possible and all the intelligence possible, we could probably trace everything back to that one common tongue that we all had at the Tower of Babel before we were divided up. Cresser makes this very important statement in outlining the historical background of the Greek language. He refers to certain grammatical handbooks as speech pictures rather than speech histories. Oftentimes when people approach the study of a language, they look at it as speech pictures. In other words, they take the language that they're stu studying and they isolate it from its history, from its family, from all the other connections around it, even from the flow of the language and the changes that have happened. There is much that we can understand about the Greek language and why things change the way they change because of the history and because of the, the change that has occurred over time in that language. And so these things are very crucial for us when we come to the Greek. <clears throat> so I give you this thought, in exegesis, the handling of the content of the New Testament must be done so without separating it from its historical context and so should the language with which it is written. So we understand we practice sound exegesis. We realize that when we study a book in the Bible that it has a context. It not only has literary, literary context, it has historical context. There's life behind it. It was written in time, in space, in history, and there was history involved in the writing of it. Well, the same thing with the language then is we understand that it has a context in which it, it's found and we need to understand that context. Dana and Manti make this statement, the historical method as applied to all phases of linguistic science is to investigate a language in light of all the periods of its own history. And we will look at some of those periods of the, the Greek and we can't get into all the details. Again, I've, I've narrowed everything down as much as possible. I can't reduce it any more than I've reduced it to, to try and simplify our understanding of the language and, and how it works, but also how it fits in history. In Blas de Bruner and Frank can make this statement, exegesis has always required an exact analysis of the language of the New Testament. They go on to say, in the New Testament, in spite of all its historical ties with its own period and preceding and subsequent periods, is a historical unity. So when we study the Greek language, we realize that it is connected to a historical narrative. We shouldn't isolate it unto itself and study it without the rest of its history around it because there's things that happen coming into the period of the Koine Greek and there's things that happen flowing out of the Koine Greek and there were changes that were happening during the time of the writing of the New Testament. And understanding those changes and that they actually were happening and that there was change happening in language helps us to better understand the language and understand then how it works and it makes it less complicated. Sometimes we, we look at something, a change of letters, and we think, man, that sounds really crazy, but it's not so crazy. So I'll give you an example. I was going to do this later, but I'll do it now. So the word kosmos in Greek, we hear the S sound at the, the first part and the first syllable, kos. Well, there are some documents in which we find two different spellings. We have kosmos and kosmos. Now we can look at them, and in the Greek... We have an S letter and a Z letter, and somewhat similar to our English. In our English, they look somewhat similar, so they don't look so different. But in Greek, they don't look very similar. They look really different compared to the English. But when you understand how the language works and how the, the words are even, the letters are pronounced, you understand the changes that happen. So we can look at the, the form of it and say, man, that's a radical change that happened. Why did that happen? But it's not so radical. So... Let me explain it to you. So if we have cosmos, we take the letter S, and we'll say it just like we do in English. So if you take your tongue and you put it, that ridge, right behind your top teeth in the front there, it's called the alveolar ridge. When you put your tongue there and pronounce it, s, s, this S, or sigma in Greek, is a alveolar letter. And so we put our tongue in that alveolar ridge, and then we blow air out, s, s. Now what's interesting is that if you look at the forms of the S and the Z, they look totally different, but the pronunciation isn't that radically different. So if you say Z, Z, 
same thing happens. You take your tongue and you put it on that alveolar ridge so the sigma in the zeta or the s and the z are both alveolar letters. The only difference is our vocal cords vibrate with one and don't vibrate with the other. So if I say s, my vocal cords are silent. They don't vibrate. But when I say z, my vocal cords vibrate, but they're both alveolar letters. So in reality, when we're pronouncing them, they're not so distinct. It's the, the difference is the vocal cords in their operation. Everything else is the same. So in form, they look radically different, but if we understand how they're pronounced and the process of pronunciation, we realize it's not that big of a deal. And so the transition from cosmos to cosmos is not that huge. And we can start to see even over time speech patterns change in the way that people pronounce, but they still stay in that same sort of classification of letter. So when we understand the language and how it works and the flow of it and all that stuff, it helps us to understand better the language itself and how it works and it makes it so much more simple. And we're not having to memorize everything, we just learn how everything is made. So the higher unity in which the language of the New Testament belongs to the Greek lingua franca or the language of its time, Blaster Bruno and Funk go on to say the brisk political and commercial relations of Athens in the 5th and 4th centuries BC had already procured for the Attic dialect a certain diffusion across Attic borders. So there was already a spread of the Greek language and there was a sense of unification already happening in Greek, but it wasn't until Alexander the Great came along and he is one by force brought unification not only to the Grecian people but also to the language. Our understanding of this reality in history helps us to understand the changes that have happened in the language. There are periods of time in which the Greek language developed, and when Alexander came along and he unified the peoples, he also unified the language, and there were changes that happened, and different influences from outside brought into the language that brought about the changes. When we understand that, that helps us understand better how the language works. Another point I wanted to look at was a living language goes through change. Everyone does. English does. Change is inseparable from life. No language is dead so long as it's undergoing change, and this must be true in spoken written usage. Robertson goes on to say, such change is not usually cataclysmic, but gradual and varied. Change happens with everything. Happens in English language, happens in every language. And the reason why I make this point about language is the fact that there are those who believe that Greek is a dead language, and there are those who still speak of it as a dead language. It's not. It's not because it's still used today. The same thing with Hebrew. It's not a dead language. It's still used today. Now, the Hebrew and the Greek of the Bible is different from the Greek that is used today, but we can see the changes that have happened throughout the life of the language. And so we look at some of those changes and it helps us to understand the language better. The vocabulary of the Greek tongue must therefore continually develop. For new ideas demand new words, new meanings from, come from old words. We see this process happening even in the New Testament. We find the Apostle Paul making up words because they don't exist and there isn't a word sufficient enough for what he wants to communicate. So he formulates his own word. He puts pieces together and makes up his own terms. Robertson goes on to say, likewise, inflections vary in response to new movements. As, as time goes on and life changes, language changes. The English language changes as time goes on. Things that meant one thing in the past don't mean that now, and so we see that those things happen. But same with the form of the language. The form of the language also changes. So here's a reality. The, there was a loss of sigma in the Greek language throughout history, and during the time of the writing of the New Testament, the sigma was starting to drop out. Now don't get hung up on this, just let it sit. So this was a phenomenon that was happening in the language during that time. So we have a rule as we learn the Greek language, and the rule is this, ligua, liquids and sigmas don't go together. This was a part of the process of the change of the language. This is important for us to understand because when we start to learn Greek, instead of memorizing a bunch of words and a whole bunch of forms, when we learn these simple rules like this, we can see the change and we can see it happening, and therefore when we see a, a, a word in the Greek text, we can take it back to its root by being able to pull it apart and knowing the changes that happen to it to form that particular word we find in the text. So all of this is crucial for us and we can't memorize or we're not going to spend time learning all the different changes that happen, but we will look at key ones as we learn the language, we'll look at key ones that are vital for us. Another key change in the Greek language that some grammars, they refer to ou and a as diphthongs. 
We have diphthongs in English. We have the word group. O and U is a diphthong. It's two vowels put together, and they are joined in the pronunciation. O and A in Greek are not true diphthongs, and they hadn't been for hundreds of years. Now, you'll read a lot of Greek grammars, and they will refer to them as diphthongs, but they're not. This is important because we will learn then that they are formed only by compensatory lengthening or contraction. And when we understand that, we will start to be able to form words in Greek and then be able to better understand the Greek and be able to translate it and read it and to be able to understand what's going on. Another phenomenon in the Greek language is some grammars refer to these as following as improper diphthongs. So we have the alpha. I'll use my little pointer here. So we have the, the alpha and we have an iota subscript, eta, iota subscript, and omega, iota subscript. Now these used to be diphthongs, and the iota was placed side by side with these letters, but over time it dropped to underneath, and it's lost its pronunciation. And I'll give you the technical term for it, methongonized, but which is from manos and thongos, which is one sound. And so they join together and they produce one sound. They're not true diphthongs. And they hadn't been for some time, but you have grammars that will teach that. And there's, there, it's important that we know this, and we'll talk about this when we learn the alphabet, that this is crucial for us to understanding the language. Another aspect I wanted to look at, if you look at your notes, <clears throat> is the issue of the developments in the history of written language. <clears throat> now this, just don't, don't worry about taking notes. Just let this sit. This is interesting to me, and it may not be to you, but it is to me. The fact that we have written language, the fact that God can communicate to us in written word and we can understand what he is saying to us is pretty amazing. I mean, normally we think about like the printing press. We think that when printing was invented in Europe, we think that was like a huge deal. And it was. It changed things for the scriptures because now you could print Bibles. And then all of a sudden you could print the Greek text and people could have their own copy when there was a time when you couldn't have your own copy of the Bible. Now you can. And that seems sort of, you know, well, sort of anticlimactic for us in this day and age. But it was a huge thing back then that people could then have the text for themselves. But what's even bigger than the printing press was the fact that there was a written language. You realize that there are thousands of languages still in existence today that do not have a written form to their language. Therefore, they cannot have the Word of God in their written language because they don't have a written form to it. My hope is that one of my kids will get so inspired to learn the original languages that they would be a part of something like that. But there are people out in the world who do not have the Word of God, cannot have the Word of God until they have a written form to their language. So my grandparents, and they were missionaries, my grandma and grandpa McDougall, they were on the mission field, and they had all of maybe, I think, one year apiece between German and French, between the two of them. They helped to develop a written system for the language of the peoples that they were working with in Africa. Then they had a linguist who came along and took that and worked with it. And some years later, when we were living in Huntington Beach, someone had brought to my father and had shown him that there was a Bible in this native tongue of these people, but it all started with my grandparents helping to formulate a written form to that spoken language. There are thousands of people who don't have that. The fact that we have the Word of God in writing is pretty amazing. And understanding then the language that he uses to communicate that revealed truth to us is vital for us understanding who he is. The issue isn't about language in and of itself. The ultimate end is to know God and to know Him accurately. So therefore we study the languages so we can do that. So the language isn't the end in and of itself. It's a means to an end. That end being a relationship with God and understanding Him clearly. And so we want to be as accurate as we can in studying the language, then in studying the text, and then knowing our God, and then walking with our God with accuracy. And this was a concern with the Old Testament. You read Nehemiah chapter 8. When Ezra got before the people and they read the law, they even, to the sense it's translated, they translated it for the people. There was such a commitment to the closeness to the original text as they read it and communicated and explained it to the people, that same desire should be for us as well today. So here is the development of the written language, and if you... Have your notes, you can follow along. We're not going to get into all the details, but 
just some interesting facts about how it developed. And again, I've broken all this down into a few pages, so this is the Reader Digest form. So everything, every written language began with pictures. There is actually in the world today only two or three systems of writing. Only three. There is one that we call the Egyptian system of writing. It is an alphabetic system. It didn't start that way, but it ended up that way because of the Greeks. Our writing system is an alphabetic system. There are only three in all of the world. All the languages that exist in written form fall into one of those three. So everything started with pictures. It all began like the Egyptian one, the hieroglyphs. So if we give some examples, and these are legit examples, we have the Sumerian Egyptian. These are the, the, the symbols that they utilize to communicate man. We have the Sumerian and Hittite for king. I know you dig that, don't you? Then we have the Sumerian Egyptian Hittite for deity. So all of these were symbols to represent that one particular object. We have the Sumerian Egyptian for water, and then we have the Sumerian Egyptian Hittite for road. All of these reflected a particular object, whether it's a man, whether it's a king, whether it's water, whether it's a road. And as long as they reflected that, they were pictograms. As long as they reflected those material objects, that is exactly what they are. They're pictograms. And you can combine these together, in which they did over time. They would take them, and you could formulate a sentence with them. And we still see that today. If you go into some restaurant, Sherry's used to do this. You did have the little cups for the little kids, and they would use pictograms, and they would give you little clues, and you'd have to figure out what the word was, right? B plus this plus this, and then you would figure out what the word is. We still use them today, but not as frequent as then. But you could put these pictograms together, and you would communicate something. So if you go into Arizona and you go back into the cliffs where we had Indians dwelling back in there, you'll still see some of their pictograms, the, the picture stories that they would tell and communicate things to other people. Over time, some of these pictograms were so connected to each other and became sort of common that they grouped together and they refer to them as phraseographs because they were used consistently together as they were communicating truth to someone. Even in our civilization today, we still use pictograms by street signs. And early Americans, when they were illiterate, they used this. So when you go into old churches, that was the reason for the stained glass windows. So we were in a chapel in France, my wife and I, and it dated way back into the 1800s. But you walk in and they had these amazing stained glass windows, and we were there at sunset. And it was so awesome to look. But each of the windows told a Bible story. And it was for those people who would come to church who were illiterate and could not read. They could at least see the stories and know what they were and the, at least the general details of those truths. But the problem came is that when you wanted to start to communicate more abstract thoughts, all of a sudden things became more difficult. When those objects ceased to be used in reference to a particular material object, all of a sudden there was changes. So say if you want man to use a picture of man to try to explain a quality of human nature, now you're moving into the abstract realm. You're not just talking about a man, you're talking about something about the man. Or water if you want to describe moisture. Or the road if you want to talk about an ethical course in life, whether the way of wisdom or road of wisdom or the way of foolishness and so on. Once we did that, all of a sudden now the process took a major leap. Now we moved from pictograms to ideograms. Because now we moved into the realm of the abstract. In other words, I'm not just showing you a picture of an ox. I'm trying to communicate something other than the picture of the ox. I can use a picture of ox and I want to describe something abstract like strength or power or determination. Now all of a sudden I've moved from pictogram to ideogram. Then from there we move to logograms, which pictograms and ideograms became more abstract, and they became sort of a shorthand type of way of writing, and this is what we refer to as logograms or syllables. So you would have two pictures put together, and they would form a syllable. Just like in English, we have several letters that we put together, and it's one syllable, like cos, mos. Cos is a syllable. Mos is another syllable. And this is what we moved into what we call syllabic or alphabetic writing. Syllabic was writing in syllables, and then we had the alphabet. Now, here's a fact, and we'll talk about this. The, the history of our alphabet came from the Phoenicians, which came from the Egyptians from the hieroglyphics. Okay? 
Now what's fascinating about this is that the Phoenicians took these hieroglyphic forms and they used them for their alphabet, but it wasn't a full alphabet, it was a syllabary. It was the Greeks who took it and then made an alphabet. In other words, they took each individual symbol and they wanted to represent a phonetic value unto itself. The Greeks did this, and from then on, it was used that way. That's where we got our alphabet from. So we learned our ABCs in school. We don't even know where they came from. That's where they came from. It came from the Phoenicians, came from the Egyptians, but it was the Greeks who turned it from a syllabary into an alphabet. So the final stage then is moving from a syllabary into the alphabet and then a single character represent a single sound or a phonetic value. So we have A, we have A or A, depending, right, in English, B, B, and all the way down, each one has its own phonetic value for that symbol. So here's a progression of the language. So you can see over time, so this is original pictograph from 3500 B.C., here we have the simplified character of it in 3000 BC. We have the archaic Sumerian from 2800, then 1800 BC Old Babylonian, Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian. Then here's the syllabic alliteration and it means fish. Some of them we can very easily see the de development that happens, this, right? And here is the syllable right here, good, which is ox. But this is where all language started. It all started with pictures. And it developed over time to where all of a sudden these things went from being a syllable, the symbol being a syllable, to actually being just a single letter. And the Greeks are the ones that did that, and then we took them over. So the Hebrew alphabet, this is interesting. We'll talk about the history of this in a moment. But So here's the Hebrew letter Aleph. That's the A for the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph means ox. Originally, this symbol was the symbol or picture of an ox. And that's what it stood for. Then as the development of the language went on, it began to be used for a phonetic value and not for that image it's representing. Then the Greek takes it over and it becomes alpha. We have the same thing with beth, which is house. Greek becomes beta. Gimel, which is camel. Greek, gamma. Daleth, door, Greek, delta. So we end up from the Greek alphabet, not only did the Greeks take over the symbols, they also took over the names. But by this time, they're only letters. They're not reflecting of the object. So if you read like Elohim in the Old Testament, you say, oh, see, Aleph was ox, and you start building this whole thing about power and all this stuff, you can't do that. Well, you can do that, but you'd be wrong. That's forcing something on the text that doesn't belong. That was an earlier, earlier period of the language. That has nothing to do with what we find in the Old Testament. By that time, it was an alphabet. But they maintained the names although they didn't signify that object anymore. So the Greek alphabet derived from the Phoenician alphabet. The roots of the Phoenician alphabet were found in the Egyptian hieroglyphics, and this is a real simple breakdown of the history of the language, from Egyptian hieroglyphic all the way down to Latin, and then finally English. This is the history of our written language. This is where we got our alphabet from. Which tells us then that the English language is a part of the Greek family. It's the same, it's a part of the Russian family. It's a part of the Italian family and all. They're all related. They're all part of the same family tree. This Egyptian source has been attested by a discovery of connecting link in the early Semitic inscriptions found in the Sinai Peninsula. So here was the, the Sinai Peninsula. So brief history, the Phoenicians are the ones who brought this hieroglyphic writing and they began to use it for their syllabary and from then the Greek and Latin and so on. The Phoenicians were a sea people. They traveled all over the world. They impacted civilization, civilizations everywhere. They were people who were, they were nomads of the sea. They were traders. They went everywhere and they impacted everyone. That's why, that's why when you go to Russia, their alphabet is the same family as our alphabet. Got it from the same place. Why? Because the Phoenicians. They took it everywhere. Well, they became not only peoples of the sea, they became peoples of the land. And there were some who settled down in the Sinai Peninsula, and we have traces of them utilizing these Egyptian forms for writing. Now, Tacitus believed this at the end of the first century A.D., and Tacitus says the Egyptians first represented concepts by means of animal figures. These oldest monuments of man, memory may be still be seen engraved in stone, and they claim to be the inventors of writing. 
From them the Phoenicians then are said to have brought the script to Greece because they ruled the seas and they received the credit for inventing what they only took over. So they took this from the Egyptians and then they are credited for inventing it. Yet there wasn't a link from Tacitus' understanding of Phoenician language to the hieroglyphics until sometime later in 1904-1905 an archaeologist Flinders Petrie he found inscriptions in the copper and Malachite mines in Sinai where he deciphered later by Gadamer and there was then the connection between the Egyptian and the Phoenician. And therefore now we finally had that connection that Tacitus long understood to be but didn't have proof for it. So this alphabet then was being seen as the source of, at least in principle, the North Semitic alphabets including the Phoenicians. So essentially the Greeks received their alphabet from a Semitic origin. So you have these graphs in your notes and I gave them for you. You can go back and look over them but we can see from the Proto-Canaanite to Early Phoenician to the Greek and the development of the language and how the alphabet was passed along. Another example is in this diagram here we have from the Phoenician to the more early Greek to the modern Greek and then into Latin. And again you can look at these on your own. Something I want to point out for you though is notice how they, bear, they carried over the name from the Phoenician over to the Greek. So we have Aleph, Alpha, Beth, Beta, Gimel, Gamma, Daleth, Delta, and all the way down. Now some of them change because they drop the, the, the name of them, but they borrowed the symbol, but pretty much all the way down you can follow. They took the symbol and the name to go with them. The other thing that's interesting is, look, they were written from right to left. Semitic languages are written from right to left. Hebrew is from right to left. So notice how they pin this. This is hey from right to left, but notice that there's going to come a change in the classical Greek where it's going to go left to right. Then you have early Latin, then you have classical Latin. Right to left, left to right. So there was a period in, in the Grecian language where they maintained that writing of right to left. So here is four significant facts, and I don't you have these embedded in your paragraphs in your notes, so they're there, but I'm just going to highlight them. First is the majority of the Phoenician alphabet is employed to represent consonants, but the Greeks also took some of those consonant letters and used them for vowels. And we'll talk about this when we learn the alphabet. Uh, two weeks from now. It, it's amazing to me, absolutely amazing how they developed all of this just so they can communicate and then so that we could communicate and so that God could communicate to us and how the development of the language, you understand, we look at this and think the ingenuity of man, no, God was active in everything. He was doing this so he could tell us what he wanted us to know. He developed all of this throughout time using man to do this so that he could give us the New Testament. I mean, think about the treasure that is. Now think about how often it spins on our shelves and we're not reading it. But history was moved. Nations were moved. Peoples were moved. Men were used to develop language and writing so that God could tell us who He is and what He wanted us to know so that we could read it for ourselves and know that. And how seldom do we take advantage of that fact? So not only did they use the consonants, they also used those letters for vowels. And then they maintain not only the letters themselves, but also the names, but they started to write like them. So in earlier years of Greek, they wrote from, left, from right to left, okay? But there was a transition. So when we read the New Testament, they're written from left to right. So when I read from Colossians, I'm reading from left to right, just like we do English. But the earlier periods, it was from right to left. But there was a period of transition, and they called it writing boustrophedon. Bustrophedon means the turning of the ox or as the ox turns at the plow. In other words, when an ox would go and plow a field, you would go down one furrow, then it would turn around and come back the next furrow, and it would do this all the way down the field. Well, that's how they would write. So they would start from the right, and they would write to the left, and they would drop the next line, go from left to right, drop the next line, right to left, and down and back and forth as they would go. And then eventually, it all just transitioned to left to right. Isolating languages. Now this is a cool part of the language. This is moving from the alphabet to the analysis of words. And this is fun. This is cool to me. The, the way that we build words. So isolating languages, you can read these in your notes, Chinese, Burmese. They depend on position of the sentence and the tone of voice for clear communication. So now we make up words. We have an alphabet, we have letters, we have symbols that represent sounds. Now we want to put them together and want to say something. 
Now we get into the formation of words, and there are different systems that language is used to formulate words to communicate truth. And there's really three groupings when it comes to languages. The first one is isolating. English is an isolating language. We have a tendency to use shorter words, and oftentimes we have to use several independent words to communicate what, say, they can in Eskimo, they can communicate in one word. Sometimes we get that in Greek. We'll find one word in the Greek text. It takes us five to translate that one word. And English has to have a certain order to it, must have. Greek, you can move words around because of the different case endings. English has to follow a certain order all the time. Unfortunately, they don't teach us in school anymore. Most kids don't even learn grammar anymore in school. But English is an isolating language, and basically, word order was the determining factor in how to communicate truth and meaning. Then next is the glutinative. This comes from two words in Latin, ad, which is to, and glutina, which is I glue. It is I glue to. We have languages like Hungarian, Turkish. They use what we call prefixes, infixes, and suffixes. A prefix is basically that which is fixed before. Suffix is that which is fixed after. And then an infix is that which is placed in the middle of the word. So I'll give you an example. This is from Swahili. This is kind of cool. So from Swahili, there is a word that sounds something like ata nipenda. Okay? Now notice the word. Here it is right here. Ata nipenda. Okay? It means he will like me. But if we change by an infix and place these two letters there instead of these ones, we have ata kupenda, which means he will like you. So with the infix placed in the middle of the word, we've then now changed the meaning of the word. When we start learning those things, it makes learning English or languages so much easier for us, and it'll make learning the Greek so much easier, and that's really what we're aiming at, is to be able to understand the Greek language and to be able to simplify it for us and not have it be so complicated. Now here's what's interesting. We have similar things happen in English. So I'll give you an example from an English word, and this doesn't fully fall into the agglutinative form, but it still gives you the idea. So here is the root word sta, okay? This means to stand. The Greek word histemi is I stand. The root is sta, and you can see that underlined right here, right? These are the Greek letters ste, and the root is sta. It's a triliteral root, okay? So we get our English word stand from, from sta. So, I want to say stable. Well, what do I do? I take sta and I combine it with able and I make stable. And it is that which is able to stand. It's amazing because we, we grow up speaking the language. We speak it before we read it or write it. We use it on a daily basis. We don't even know mostly how it works. If we knew it, we would become masters of it. And this is why we approach the Greek language the way that we do, to look at it from a historical linguistic perspective. Because when we understand how it works, it simplifies learning the language. Most languages, if you want to memorize them, you have this whole system of you just memorize all these different forms. You have all these cards over and over. You just keep memorizing them until they're ingrained in your head. But that doesn't help you in understanding the way that the language works. So, the word to establish means to make able to stand. It's from Latin. We have the prefix, a part, and ish, to make. Establishment is the act or result of making to stand alone. I add prefixes and suffixes, and at times infixes, and we change the meaning of words. We do this all the time. We use these words, we half the time don't even mentally acknowledge they're related. Right? And we actually have a lot of words in English that come from the Greek. And if we understood their roots, we'd better understand how to use them in our own language. The final form is the inflectional. Inflectional languages such as Latin have elaborate system of word endings for nouns, verbs, and other parts of speech. These endings indicate such things as tense. So we have aorist, perfect, present. We talk about those. That's reflected by different forms. We have number. Number is in English. We have that number means how many. So number, we're talking about is it singular or is it plural? Number is, do we have a box or do we have boxes, singular or plural? We have these same elements in the English language, but half the time 
One, we don't learn them in school anymore. You're not taught grammar anymore, so you don't learn these things. And the other is we just don't even think about it when we speak. But we use these things all the time. These things are vital in, in our understanding of Scripture. We have to ask ourselves these questions when we study the Word of God. Well, what words are here? So I sit down with my kids and we'll talk about it. We'll look and say, okay, is that talked, talks, or talking? The ending makes a difference, whether it's an S, an E-D, or an I-N-G. It changes what's being communicated, right? All these things are important. So if we're going to talk about interpretation, these things are vital for us. We want to study the Word of God. Some people go, I don't know how to make sense of this. Sure you do. Just look at the language. The final thing I want to look at, we'll talk about the different divisions of the Indo-European family and just break them down. But notice the term here. We'll take the word mother from English. These are all a part of the same family tree, Indo-European. So we have English, Sanskrit, Greek, Mater, Latin, Mater, Old Slavic. We have Danish, Anglo-Saxon, Old English, and German. If you look at them and read through them, they're all similar. They all come from the same family. We're all related, really. And because of this, then, we can trace back to what the parent tongue was. There is a parent tongue that lies behind these things. There are lots of similarities like this, and we can do this throughout language. And so when we understand that, we realize that there are some unique things that happen. There are things that happen in Spanish that also happen in Greek. Like in Greek, they like to place... On the front, they would place, you know, a, a, a vowel letter and then before two consonants. Spanish does the same thing. Why? Because they're a part of the same family. There are resemblances that, that occur. So when I studied Russian in Russia, it was easier for me to learn the, the language because of the grammar aspect and all that because I already knew Greek. My wife, she learned it from the speaking aspect because she had to use it on the street. But of all the technicalities and stuff, I learned it faster because I already knew Greek. And they're a part of the same family, and so there's similarities. Another part of the family is the Indic. We have the Vedic texts that are preserved for us. The, the Rig Veda, which were a collection of hymns dating back to 1000 BC. From the Sanskrit, we have other related languages that are related to the Greek. We have classical Sanskrit, we have Prakit, we have Pali, we have Hindi, we have Gypsy. All of these are a part of the same family tree. The Iranian, the Avestan, formerly called Zend, based on a misunderstanding. We have the Old Persian, which is known from the cuneiform inscriptions, mainly of Darius I and Xerxes. So even when you look at the Old Testament, you think, well, Hebrew was radically different from the, the language of other peoples. Not really. Not really. There was a lot of similarities. The Armenian, the Albanian, the Greek, and the Greek had several dialects. And eventually it ended up getting narrowed down to one and they borrowed the, the Ionic, which in Athens by law was passed. This was going to be the, the common vernacular they were going to use, but that was a result of Alexander the Great. He is the one who united his people. We have the Italic, which Latin belongs to this grouping, but we have Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanish. Romanian, they all belong to the same group, the Celtic, which is from my heritage, the Scots. We have the Gaelish of Caesar's time, Welsh, Cornish, Breton, Manx, Irish, Scotch, Gaelic. All of them are a part of the same family tree, the Indo-European. The Germanic, which English is a branch of this. We belong to the Germanic line, to which belong the Dutch and also the Old Gothic, the Scandinavian, the Danish, the Icelandic, Norwegian, and Swedish. And then the Balto-Slavonic. You have the Old Bulgarian, Russian, Servo-Croatian, Slovenian, Bohemian, Polish, Sobanian, Windish, Baltic grouping, Old Prussian, Letic, and Lithuanian. All of these languages are all related. And the alphabet is all very similar, at least coming from the same root, but suffer changes. The distinct periods of the, the Greek language, we have the pre-Homeric period, the classical period, and the Koine period. The period that we're concerned with is the Koine period, and that's the Greek of the New Testament. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time looking at is that period and the language during that period. But we have, we'll at times look back to the classical period. There are times when I am teaching from the New Testament, and I am looking at the classical time and the period of the language and the change that happened in certain words as I explain them in a context so that we understand the growth of it. But the main influence in that period was Alexander the Great. He is the one who unified the language and brought it to the point that it was. And you have all of that stuff in your notes. 
Then we have the Byzantine or medieval period from AD 330 to 1453. And during this period, we have the, the ecclesiastical Greek. There was a development then of more church language. Like when we were in Russia, there was the street language that everyone used, the vernacular of the street, and then you had the church language. And so they had their own vocabulary. So most of my time was spent in the context of the church and the seminary. So I had a totally different vocabulary than my wife did. My wife, she spoke everything on the street, in the stores, marketplace, and all that. So both of us together, we could carry on a conversation with anybody. But they had two different types of languages. And so that happened within the Greek language during the Byzantine period and the medieval period. And then we have the modern period of the Greek language. I give you some of the resources that we have for the Greek language. And you can read through that in your notes. But that is basically the written language in a nutshell. Looking at the alphabet and where it came from to the history of that language. And we'll look at these elements as we start to learn the language. Week after next, we're going to come back and we will look at the alphabet. We'll look at the letters and learn them. But I'm trying to take as much as possible and reduce everything to the extent that it can possibly be done without ruining the language. But we'll talk about the history of the language and the different developments that happened, and that will help us in our learning of it. It'll make it simpler. It, it will without a doubt.